How's that? Testing one, two, one, two. Boy, it's a high tech place here, man. Look at all that stuff. It was a great fight, mom, but I lost. Amen. There it is. Am I on now? Yeah. Praise there God. Is. Good. Thank you, sir. Appreciate this church, though, and, and, and this surprise that the preacher said about getting the new book. Boy, that encouraged me. But we've been getting blown out of the saddle. We got 11,000 copies printed for the first printing, and um, they came in about two weeks ago. And the next day, 6,000 went out, pre-sold already. That's not too shabby. But uh, anyway, but it's a wonderful book to give to your lo lost loved ones. Yes. And, um, and, you know, I have a friend of mine that said... Um, he said, the only other uh, book I ever saw that was written for lost people to read was put out by Paul Chapel out in the West Coast. I said, well, listen, I've never read that guy's book, but I can tell you the difference between the way his book would read and the way mine will read to the respective audiences. I said, uh, and I haven't even read the guy's book. I said, Paul Chapel, a nice guy he might be, could not tell you what the Italian groundhog in Philadelphia said when they asked him if he saw his shadow. It's a true story. You got Punxsahani Phil upstate, right? Yeah. Well, in, the set in Philly, you got uh, Sonny Bruno. And this is a true story. How many ever met an Italian groundhog? <laughs> they asked him if he saw his shadow, and he said, I didn't see nothing. <laughs> I told the preacher that. Now, as dumb as that sounds, would you like a Bible verse to go with it? Yeah. The common people heard Jesus gladly. That's it. I'm not Jesus, but I grew up in three Irish bars in the Upper East Side of Manhattan before I was ever saved. And I can, tell, I can communicate to your lost loved ones a lot easier than a normal pastor might. That's all, that's all I know. So I appreciate that gesture big time. But the best thing you'll ever do is get you your own copy. Preacher's got a case of them already. And read it. It's only 65 pages. And it will very much impress you with the clarity. And that's, uh, you know, I'll be saved 50 years in August. I finally learned a few things. And so I appreciate your generosity as a church. That's, that's outside of the box, brother. Amen. All right, you got your Bibles? Open the book of Job. A lot of new faces here. So um, my books are on the table. Any book is $20, any three for 50 That's not bad when three of those books are $30 on my website. We sell them every day out of Knoxville, Tennessee, Baptist Technologies. Some company there takes care of all this for me. And every day they're going out, $30 on the barcode, the book on Israel, 900 pages, 18,000 hours to compile it, six years, $30. Uh, the new book here is 25. The hardest book I have to keep, not the new book, the last new book, per Perilous Times. And then the... Um, the book on American Baptist history, homeschool moms buy them all the time. Hardest book I have to keep in print, that's 30 But here, they're $17 a piece when you buy three of them, three for 50 So anyway, I sold a lot of books here last time. I'm not hard up. I just want you to get as much opportunity to learn. Amen. You know what Einstein used to say, anybody home? He used to say, I never let my schooling interfere with my education. Amen. <laughs> Won't that be something to think about? You want to get educated? Educate yourself. That's it. Uh, Charles Spurgeon used to say, if any man refuses to use the brains of other men, he proves he has no brains of his own. Rather than you need to read. Then he used to say, visit many books, but live in the Bible. Amen. But live in the Bible, but visit other books. Okay, so, um, and anyway, I, especially me, I take bad checks, debit cards, somebody else's <laughs> debit cards. You got a nice watch. <laughs> Let me see it. Banana bread. I'll look at anything. Banana bread. I should put some banana bread. I can't wait to go to this Indian restaurant the pastor's wife's talking about. <laughs> For years I've laughed at, this, at the very thought of the, what the sign says, Indian cuisine. I used to laugh at that. But I always like to try new things. <laughs> so I told the preacher's wife, we've got to hit that Indian joint. <laughs> All right. You got your Bible open to Job. We're going to have a good time today. Amen. I, I'm going to re, I'm going to, I, when I was here last time, I might have given the outline I'm going to give this morning, but half this room is new to me. Yep. And repetition is the key to learning, and repetition is God's volume control. Uh, but then we're going to have a, a big time Resurrection Sunday uh, message 
in the main service. And then Monday and Tuesday, we're going to keep the thing going. I'm going to give you a Palm Sunday message Monday. And Tuesday, I'm going to give you a message about the crucifixion. Amen, brother. And then Wednesday, we're going to get wild. <laughs> I, I saved the craziest stuff to the last day to get all the offering in and book sales before it's the last night. <laughs> and uh, so... You want to preach on Wednesday night? Straighten up and fly right. That's the title. Come on, brother. That's an old Nat King Cole song. Any old timers remember that? <laughs> Straighten up and fly right. That's Wednesday night, unless the Lord comes back. All right. Got your Bible open to Job. This will just, I'll give you this in a Sunday school uh, format. Um, blah, blah, blah. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Is Job before or after Proverbs? It's in there somewhere. Psalms. All right, Job 24. Let me ask you three quick questions, okay? Things are pretty chaotic out there. I have a couple um, black preacher friends of mine from the old days. One of them had a sermon in Chicago called Chaos and the Cosmos. And uh, the other one had a title I've never forgotten. It. I can't remember the message, but I never forgot the title. You may be saved down here, but you ain't necessarily safe down here. The, uh, and, and uh, the preacher, if I stutter, that's my Biden impersonation. If I, fall up a, if I fall up a flight of steps, that's another Biden impersonation. We, we had, uh, I had 25 of these ca cases of these books lost by the post office, and, you're pre and then some of them trickled in eventually. The preacher got the, and I, because I replaced the ones that were lost, so you all had a case of these, but then a second case came in, the original case banged up box. But if you haven't read this, if you're so new, you haven't still got it. Very key book, very critical book about current events, COVID, the election, you know, Ukraine, everything. My own grandmother was born in the Ukraine. Blah, blah, blah. There's a picture right here. Whoop. Picture of my grandmother here in the Ukraine and my grandfather's Irish, Grady. But um, I have a chapter in this book called uh, about Rahab the harlot. The greatest comparison uh, or parallel illustration uh, uh, between her situation and us. Uh, she was right with God in the Old Testament sense with the covenant she made with Joshua. Joshua spies and we're saved in the church age and we're safe. Yep. But we're both sharing a similar situation. The title of the chapter is called Trapped in a Terrified City. Yeah. Am I right? Yeah. She was right, but she had to wait for the walls to come down. That was an accursed city. This, this country is going down. And you read my books. I love this country, what it used to stand for, and how it fits into God's plan. I know all that stuff. And, uh, and, and uh, I still believe in voting. Say amen right there. Amen. This country had the freedoms it has because of people make fun of the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. You go read over there in 1 Timothy chapter uh, 2. When Paul got out of jail, knowing his Roman citizenship was not going to save him anymore, and he could see the handwriting on the wall because the, the Roman government figured out the Christians were in another sect of Judaism. And they started seeing the Jews persecuting the Christians. Well, woke him up then. That's where the persecution started. Paul said, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, intercessions, prayers, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. But this is well-pleasing to God. We'll have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. He got his head whacked off the next year. Yep. He told the churches to start praying for a government that would be favorable to the spreading of the gospel. You know what? It took 17 centuries for that prayer to get answered. You know that? Call the Bill of Rights. Yeah. First time Christians could preach and not be harassed. Ain't that something? And we threw it away after 150 years or so, 200 years. It was nice while it lasted, wasn't it? Um, so, the, um, right now we're at the end of all this chaos, and it's going to get crazier and crazier, you know that. And uh, when I was born, Harry Truman was having a Thanksgiving dinner in the White House. So I've seen, you know, 13 presidents and one so-called resident, as they say. Anybody that's close enough older than my age knows this is, never, this is unprecedented. Young people have no idea how crazy things are because yeah. they've never seen sanity. Yeah. 
Look, when Bill Clinton and Jimmy Carter look good, you know we're in trouble. <laughs> Stinking Obama looks good. Praise <laughs> God. But uh, anyway, so things are nutty, right? I said I want to ask you three questions. Ready? First question is, uh, how many of you, and humor me because the answers are going to be obvious, right? How many of you think God knows what's going on? Raise Amen. your hand. All right. Obviously, right? Black preacher friend of mine had another sermon called, Did It Ever Occur to You That Nothing Occurs to God? Yeah. All right. How many, the second question, how many of you know God? Raise your hand. Amen. All right. Third question. Preacher, doesn't, this doesn't involve you now. You never mess with the guy controlling the love offering. Say amen right there. Amen. Always make him look good. So you're not a part of this preacher. <coughs> How many of you, uh, all right, so how many of you know God, believe God knows what's going on? Yeah. How many of you know God? Yeah. Randy? How many of you know what's going on? How about that? I didn't ask you how many of you know the date of the rapture. How many of you know what's going on? Now, you know, Job would be scratching his head right now if he saw the results of that poll. Want to see the verse? One verse. Verse 1, tw chapter 24, why, comma, Seeing t times are not hidden from the Almighty, do they that know him not see his days? How about that? God knows what's going on, and you know God. How come you don't know what's going on? See that? When the first pope wanted to know who the son of perdition was at the Last Supper, he had to ask the man whose head was on Jesus' breast. That man was John, and you know, from, again, you have a good Bible teaching pastor here, and John's a picture or a type of the church. Yeah. He's the disciple whom Jesus loved. Christ loved the church, gave himself for it. And he's got his head right on Jesus' breast. And Peter has to ask John to find out who the son of perdition was. And you've heard that great English nugget about the sop being the son of perdition, SOP. You've heard that. I preach in a lot of fundamentalist churches. All they know is Ruckman was the devil. They don't know any Bible, but they know that part. You're spoiled to get all those insights. Those are English nuggets. So God wants the church to know what's going on. He wants his people to know what's going on. Yeah. You get into the heart of the Old Testament, the book of Chronicles, the children of Issachar were pointed out for being men of understanding of the times, to know what Israel ought to do. You get into Matthew 16, Jesus balls the Pharisees out yeah. for not, not being able to pick up on the prophetic signs, but they can re read the weather signs. I could see him saying, uh, hey, hey I, the Bible doesn't say he said this, but you could see him saying it. Hey, uh, how come you didn't uh, notice when I had you sit down in the green grass to feed you those five loaves and two fishes? Didn't David tell you I was going to do that when he wrote the 23rd Psalm? Makes me to lie down in green pastures. Yeah, yeah. You didn't see it, did you? Time of, missed the time of your visitation. Well, you get into 2 Timothy, turn over there, and you get to the end of the church age, and God wants the, the last generation to know he's moving around. You know, preacher, I love that verse. When you see the mulberry trees blowing around, bestir thyself. Remember that? Yeah. When you see God starting to move, get oh, ready. Yeah. First of all, don't buy any cemetery plots on cash. <laughs> Put them on time payments, amen? Yeah. See, the body of Christ is pretty dumb right now. Not all of them, but most of them. Uh, especially preachers. No need for it. You know, Jack Hiles used to say there are three types of people in the world. The first group of people makes things happen. The second group of people watch things happen. And a third group of people don't know what's happening. How many of you know what the Baptist salute is? <laughs> <laughs> you know? You understand? You don't have to know the date of the rapture, but you should know it when God's starting to move around. Come on, brother. Amen. It gets you excited. <clears throat> Look over at uh, verse 1, chapter 3. This know also that in the last days, revival is going to come. Yeah. See that word perilous? That's the only place in the King James Bible where that word is used. And again, you're a sharp enough bunch of people to know the importance of a Webster's 1828 English dictionary. That, that dictionary, get used to using it, you can, you'll almost get spiritual but devotional blessings out of it because it's so good. That, I mean, it, it's so right on. That word perilous means, if you look it up, it says dangerous, hazardous, full of risk. Don't you think every Chinaman and everybody in India... And all over the world would sign off on that uh, definition without any idea that it's a, connected even with a Bible word yep. because of what they went through in those two years of COVID. Yeah. Let, me, let, me, let me ask you a question. 
How many of you remember during 2020 and 2021 when you had all those uh, signs on all the doors and all the businesses, and commercial buildings, especially government buildings, remember all that stuff? You had all those signs on the front door. How many remember that? Remember what it said? The King James Bible is the inspired, preserved, perfect, and errant word of God. Anybody remember reading that? Raise your hand if you remember seeing that. Grady, Gradyites, look, whatever he says. <laughs> I love the word of God, never does. It didn't say that. See, well, it wasn't worded just like that. How about social distancing six feet? Yeah. Did, you re did you see those signs? Yeah. Well, haven't you ever thought about that? How come they didn't say five feet or seven feet? Yeah. Right? Again, preacher, I, you messed me up. When, you, when I get brought to a church like this, it takes away a lot of my thunder. You know what I mean? Because I'm used to sneaking up on fundamentalists. Here, every time I'm ready to spring something on you, the Holy Spirit says, they know what you're getting ready to say. <laughs> Proverbs, look at this crazy stuff up here. Yeah, sex is man's number, right? And uh, you know all that stuff. You, you don't want to impress a teenager trying to get him to come to church and put his phone down for five minutes. You show him that amazing nugget of Romans 6.6. 6. Six books, six chapters, six word. Man, ain't that something? You read the NIV, they add a word and uh, make it seven words instead of six, and then it's the word self instead of man. But no, nonetheless, okay, so what's the bottom line? Well, when you kick the bucket, where do you go? Amen. Unless you're dumb enough to want to be cremated to save your kids a few bucks. <laughs> I didn't say that. If you repeat that, I'll deny it. Buried in the likeness of his death. Yeah. Burned in the likeness of his death. Yeah. <laughs> All right. A, uh, so you go six feet under. So what the nutty CDC is trying to say, if you want to uh, avoid going six feet that way, stay six feet that way. They don't know why they're saying it, but Dr. Ruckman used to say that King James Bible controls the world, whether the Amen. world knows it or not. There's, there's so much truth in that. So uh, the lost people in your neighborhood they're going to say that lost men that won't come to this church, they're familiar with maybe some colloquial expressions like uh, throwing the garbage can. And that's file 13 to them, right? Yeah. And they say deep six something. That means kill it. They don't even know the Bible. But you go six feet under, so you've got the expression deep six. So I've got three little points in this outline, what to expect in the last days. And again... Neither one of us can tell you dogmatically that we are now in the last days. Paul thought he was in the last days when he wrote 1 Thessalonians 4, thinking he's going to go up at the rapture because God never told him how long it was going to be. Uh, but uh, we're, we're, what we can say is that when the last days begin, dogmatically, the outline and the traits for that period are listed here in 20 signs in chapter 3. And... Uh, but it all starts out by telling you a negative, big negative. It's going to be very, it's going to be perilous. It's going to be bad news. And so the first point is deep six. It's going to be plenty of death before you get out of here. You saw a little tid, tid, tidbit of it during COVID. I used to love to hear Dr. Ruckman uh, rehearse that uh, Mad Magazine cartoon from the World War II scene of the B-17 pilot uh, holding on the controls of his plane with the windshield blown out and the mm -hmm cockpit full of smoke and a co-pilot bleeding to death and the pilot says to the co-pilot, man, if you think this is bad, wait till we get out of the hangar. <laughs> That's a great truth. You haven't seen President Kamala Harris yet. Yeah. You know, all the different theories about what could happen, there's a lot of them out there. One of the leading theories, if you haven't heard it, is that Nutjob's going to step down in May so that Kamala can be, break the glass ceiling, be the first woman president. Yep. And then she's going to put... Uh, either Gavin Newsom in or, or, or uh, whack job uh, Michelle Obama in or Michael Obama, whatever his name is, as vice president, then she's going to step down and be forced out. And one of those two perverts will become the president without having been elected. And then they're going to try to throw Trump in jail by August, either, either one of those two black gals in New York or Atlanta. And then, uh, you know, it's going to cause insurrection. So then martial law will be declared. And, but, but don't feel bad, it's only for two weeks. Remember flattening the curve? Yeah. Two weeks. Flattening the curve. Yeah. Hey, the Bible said perilous times are going to come. come what on, do you brother. expect? Yeah. 
But anything can happen. But uh, we haven't gotten out of the hangar yet. But um, I got a phone call from some woman, I don't know, about 20 years ago. She said, Brother Grady or Dr. Grady, whatever, she said, you don't know me. My name is so-and-so, and, -so, and I'm, um, I know you. From, I have a couple of your books or something. She said, I'm calling to find out if you'd be willing to witness to my unsaved uncle. She said, he's an Italian, he's a Catholic, and he's a lifetime uh, New Yorker. She said, maybe you could make some points with him. I said, well, I'll be glad to witness anybody. You know, what's your uncle's name? She said, Yogi Berra. How about that? Now, pray for the young people here, because they don't even know who Yogi Berra was, no. who was patterned after Yogi Berra. But he was the all-star uh, catcher for the Yankees in their heyday. The M&M &M boys, they call him, Mantle and Maris. He was number seven, right? And uh, w when I was a little dweeb uh, kid, I used, to, I used to go to the Yankee Stadium to see the Yankees play ball. I was 10 years old, 11, when my mother died. So, I, so this dates me in my memory. I saw I'm under 11, 10 years old or younger. I'd jump on a subway in Manhattan, go up to the Bronx, the Yankee Stadium, or sometimes with my friends. You can't let your 10-year-old kid go to the mailbox now no, without having a 30 out 6 in your hand, <laughs> keeping an eye out. Am I right? Yeah, right? We're out there street preaching yesterday. Some freak comes up. Yeah. thinking paint all over his face, crazy on drugs, yeah. Yeah. screaming at us. Where's Jacob at? My man Jacob tries to get the dude a track. He puts a cigarette out in the guy's track. Yeah. Crazy people out there. Do I have to tell you that? Where's the young people at? Okay, got a few young people. Can I tell you my crazy joke? I mean, I don't know. That's politically incorrect to say nut house, right? Today? <laughs> not, not here. You know what cosity bots means in Italian? Cosity bots. Crazy ass. So there were these two, the, there were these two, America needs me. There were these two nuts in a nut house with padded cells, and one of them had a flashlight. So he's uh, flashing a you know, the beam of light up there to the ceiling. And the other nut says, uh, taps him on the shoulder, says, hey, man, what are you doing with that flashlight? He said, don't bother me, man. A couple minutes later, the guy taps him on the shoulder again. He says, hey, man, what are you doing with that light? He said, I told you, don't bother me, man. <laughs> Finally, the guy taps him on the shoulder. He said, what do you want? He said, if you don't tell me what you're doing with that flashlight, I'm going to take it away and beat you to death with it. He said, okay, okay, all right, relax. He said, you see that beam of light up there? I said, yeah. He said, I bet you 10 bucks you can't climb up that beam of light. <laughs> Guy said, what do you think, I'm nuts? Before I got halfway up there, you turn it off. Eh? <laughs> My mother told me that joke, so that goes back to about 1960. It does seem like an asylum in here. Everybody's sick. Yeah. America needs me. You know, keep back about six feet. Amen. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, so we're going to have plenty of death. Oh, back to Yogi Bear. So she was going uh, to get back to me, but she never did. Maybe he, she asked him about it. He didn't want to talk to a stranger. I don't know. But Yogi Bear was famous for crazy sayings. And they were called yogiisms. It's a couple of you old timers nodding your head. Oh, when you get to the fork in the road, take it. Uh, you can observe a lot of things by watching. And uh, all, get on the internet. There's hundreds of them. Baseball is 90% perspiration and 10% you know uh, attitude. It's, I mean, 50% attitude. Just nonstop <laughs> crazy things. And his most enduring yogiism uh, fits today like a hand in a glove. It's so, it's so well known, I can start it, you can finish it just like that, all right? Ready? It ain't over till it's over. So I'm not trying to be Debbie Downer, but I think things ended when Trump was forced out of the White House after his first term with that crazy election, when he had the nuclear football. He couldn't hold on to power. How's he going to get back in? Preacher and I were talking about it. There's only a couple of key battleground states they got to fix. Hello? Isn't that terrible? Yeah. Terrible, yes, but necessary. Yeah. Listen, I said something terrible here about the first family. I said, bullet Trump train derailed by train wreck administration of Amtrak Joe and his Carmel caboose. Amen right there.
forcing Bible believers to refocus their attention on the one whose train filled the temple. But then I really got in trouble, I think, quoting the Antichrist down in Pensacola. Every nation eventually ends up with the government it deserves, end of quote. Yeah. Peter S. Ruckman. So again, I don't want to be Debbie Downer, but this is reality that we're in now. I'll give you a three-point outline for America. Our past is blessed as the nation whose God is the Lord. Our present is righteousness exalteth the nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. National gender, transgender identity coming out of the closet day or whatever. Today, today. Joe Biden declared today National Transgender Day. Easter Sunday as the world even looks at it. I mean, you, you just hang around. Every day it gets worse. I have a whole chapter in this book dedicated to the thought that every day things are getting nuttier, right? And, and the devil wants to rattle you. Oh, my God, what are they going to do next? When's our, you know, what's going to happen to me, right? Meaning everything's out of control is how your mind starts to see things. And I say in that, book, in that chapter, if you want some therapy that will work, every time you see something new, like today, yep. you know what you tell yourself? All you got to do is say one thing to yourself, and you'll, you'll calm yourself down. Say, what's that, preacher? Man, well, boy, God must really be mad at this country. <laughs> See, that brings you back into focus that he's involved with all this. Yes, he is. Yeah. Amen. America's future, the wicked shall be cast into hell, and all nations that forget God. You're going to need a lot of body bags, maybe over a billion when the tribulation period gets in the high gear, yes? You know where those body bags are going? Well, let me tell you where they're not going. They're not going to China. They're not going to Vietnam, Korea. They're not going to India. What do you mean? Well, let me tell you where they are going. The first five places they're going would be Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Great Britain, and the United States. So why is that? I don't know. I don't know about you, but I believe the Bible could be true. Amen. I do. I have 50 years I'm saved in August. I think it's true. Amen. I just gave you the verse. The wicked shall be cast into hell and all nations, nations that what? Forget. What do you mean they're not going to go to China? How could you forget somebody that you never met? I live in East Tennessee. I just was in East Germany for 10 days. And I just got back to good old East Tennessee. Glory to God in the Lamb. Got more Baptists in Tennessee than people. Don't you have a hymn in your hymn book? Let those refuse to sing who never knew our God. Doesn't Peter tell you judgment must begin where? We're in trouble, neighbor. Jer Jericho was in a cursed city. This country is beyond a curse. I was saved 50 years this August coming up, 1974. I can remember the preachers back then saying that if God spared America, he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. And that's when Roe v. Wade was just one year old. You know we're in trouble as a people. That's why you can't get upset or shook up or negative and Nancy. You know, this is reality. It ends with a bang. First point of the outline, deep six. There's going to be plenty of death between now and the end days yeah. when we get out of here. All right, what's the second point? All right, what about this COVID that was killing everybody and the grandmother? Was that, deep, was that a, 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 a pandemic or a pandemic? Well, I think it was a scamdemic and a pandemic. I don't know everything. I don't, you know, the older you get, the less you want to act like you know everything. Yeah. Somebody yeah. might ask you a question. I have a chapter in this uh, Perilous Times book on the uh, COVID. It's called uh, Inventors of Evil Things. And there's a lot of documentation there. Most of you are familiar with this, though. Uh, but this stuff is, this stuff is crazy. Uh, who's responsible for that? I was just preaching in uh, Mooresville, North Carolina the other day. I told those Tar Heels, hey, started right down the, in your neighborhood here at Chapel Hill, University of North Carolina, then went over to Wuhan Labs. And Rand Paul, a doctor, has all that documentation. But who, who, who are all these corrupt people? Is, that a, is it really a conspiracy? Well, our opinions are okay, and they might be a blessing to you, but they're not infallible. How about if the Bible tells you whether it was a pandemic or not? There's a verse right here looking at you. Look at uh, 
Look at chapter 3, verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, right? Well, right after that, they're going to give you 20 things to look for. 20 signs. Could you, how could you make up something like this? 2,000 years ago, Paul is in the Mamertine dungeon in Rome. It's still there if you want to visit it. It's a dungeon that's underneath the, the main dungeon. And he's down there writing. The last thing he's going to write before his head gets cut off. And the first thing God tells him to alert the body of Christ at the end, first sign to look for is men shall be loved, <laughs> lovers of their own selfies. How could you get anything better than that to look at? <laughs> that, that, this is like a drug. Yep. You know, you see it. Yeah. Young people, hello. You know what I did last night in my hotel? I watched the Ten Commandments, glory to God. Really? With Charlton Heston, <laughs> praise God. I was a lost kid in New York watching that. That's the only Bible I ever saw, <laughs> Catholic Church. I tell young people, don't get impressed with these things. Moses was downloading data from a cloud on his tablets a long time before Bill Gates had his first diaper chain. All right? Now, there's 20 signs listed there. Now, you know, you wonder, I don't get these signs. I, you know, I was saved 30 years. I was scratching my head like most all of you maybe, right? What, are, what is this signs? Uh, wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, Jesus telling you that in Matthew 24 for the signs for the end of the world. What kind of signs are those? You've always had earthquakes and wars and famines, right? Every Christian scratches his head. You want to see how simple it is to explain it? How many mothers in here? Raise your hand. Any lady with their hand up can tell you. I married a future mother when I got married, and she was a labor and delivery nurse on top of that. Ask any mother in here if the labor pains don't become more intense the closer you get to delivery. All these, Jesus said, are the beginning of sorrows. First time the word sorrow shows up, Genesis chapter 3, birth pains. Anybody home? So, for instance, uh, disobedient to parents is listed in this list. Uh, you all heard Mark Twain tell parents 150 years ago, when your kid's uh, disobedient, no, when your kid hits six, uh, 13, stick him in a barrel with a hole in the barrel for air so he can breathe. <laughs> you ever heard that? And when he turns 16, plug the hole up. Say amen right there. So kids have always been a pain in the parents' keisters, you know. But when you got the Menendez brothers in the 1990s killing their parents, a new wave of stuff started. Yeah. So you got a word in the dictionary called patricide, murder of parents. I told a preacher, I heard the crazy story of my life last week. Some Chinese guy in Virginia, late 1990s, his parents were interfering with his marriage to a non-Chinese girl, so he killed them, shot them in their beds, and his brother in America, in Virginia. And he left, left a big mansion, $20 million mansion, left them in the beds for four years, decomposing, mowing the grass outside to keep the appearances up. Are you kidding, neighbor? I'm a telling you, neighbor, it's getting crazy out there. What does that mean? Look at the labor pains. Yeah. I'm getting closer to the end. Yeah. Now, so, so what about COVID? You said you give us a Bible word. You think there's some sneaky things going on today? Corrupt things? Perverted things? Sure. I don't know. What's the first word in verse 4 say? Thank you very much. Elvis has left the building. What's that word doing in there? Why did God tell you to look for traitors in the end? Because they're all over the place, from the church house to the White House. Well, now it's a crack house, too. And it's a whore house with Biden's transgender freaks running all over the place half naked the other day. You know, Ronald Reagan would not even take his jacket off in the White House to show respect. That's when Obama threw his legs up on the desk and started this. Bad news, neighbor. Traitors. Now, let's take the analogy of the uh, labor pains. Did we have traitors when America was first set up? Sure. Benedict Arnold. Guys like him, but they were in the minority. The loyalists didn't betray any revolution. They never joined it. But the ones who betrayed it were very small. Most of them were patriots, like Nathan Hale, the school teacher from Connecticut, hung as a spy. His last words on the gallows, I regret that I have but one life to lose for my country. Now, that's America's star. Look at it now. Flip it over. The majority are traitors, that's it, too. and the real patriots are in a small minority. That's it. And listen, I'm tired of Christians that are trying to bash Trump all the time because he's not a prima donna. 
Are you nuts? If you want a prima donna, you go. You look at the the the, uh, the uh, qualifications for a bishop in chapter three. The qualifications for a government leader are in chapter two, and the only one that's mentioned there is they give the church peace, a chance to preach. Some of these Christians in uh, when Trump was running the first time, uh, I hear he has mafia contacts in New York. How the snot are you going to build a skyscraper in Manhattan without knowing what palms you got to grease? <laughs> what are you, nuts? You want another Baptist in there like Jimmy Carter or Bill Clinton? I'm glad, I'm glad Trump knows the mob. What are you, crazy? I didn't think he got so much stuff done when he was the president. Christians are very dumb. I, I can't help. Two Christians are arguing. How come you don't go to church if you're saved? Guy says, because I used to go to church. Christians can drive you crazy. I'm telling you, you got to hang in there with them. How many of you know why Italians hate Jehovah's Witnesses? They hate all witnesses. They hate all witnesses. Okay, one of my groupies back here. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> I'm a telling you, neighbor. Uh, how many of you remember why Italians have short necks? <laughs> well, I'll tell you. I'm... All right, I'll give you one you haven't heard. How many of you know what the difference is between an Italian grandmother and an elephant? What? That's a strange bird back there. I never told that one here, though. Blah, blah, blah. How, anybody remember how you break up an Italian wedding? Good. Somebody else does cements here. Blah, blah, blah. Rodney Dangerfield said his neighborhood was so tough as a little kid, he played in the cement like kids would do. He said, but in his neighborhood, you put your hand in the cement, sometimes you'd feel another hand. David. Blah, blah, blah. How about that traitors in there? Isn't that something? Uh, so second point of my little outline is deep six is one. Second step point is deep state. Uh, the deep state. There's a lot of terrible... Leg uh, listen, don't get nervous, but I believe we went to the moon. <laughs> And I believe the earth is round. Amen. And I believe Sandy Hook was a real shooting. Yeah. And I believe in Christmas trees. I don't care what you say. <laughs> you can have Santa. You can definitely have the Easter Bunny. And you can have Halloween. But you're not getting my bail bush. I'm an ex-Catholic. I ain't going to give that thing up. My Yule log is here forever. Hey, let me show you some things here. Again, I may have shared this three years ago when I was here, but so many new people. This is really worth seeing. And this, this book took six years to write because there was a lot of stuff to dig up, a lot of research to do. I paid the Honolulu Advertiser newspaper in Honolulu $250 for written permission to print the front page of their newspaper seven days before the sneak attack on Pearl Harbor. Remember the sneak attack? I've, I think, again, I think I've shared that with you. There's the front page headline. Yeah. Hold on. Japanese may strike over weekend. Look at the top. That's some sneak attack. <laughs> Here's the article right here. Leaders call troops back in Singapore. Here's one of the four little bullet headlines under that. Three words. You can read it with the naked eye right there. Hawaii troops alerted. There's the date, November 30th, 1941, seven days before... Pearl Harbor. By the way, while we're looking at cool things, here's the, um, here's the guy that led the attack on Pearl Harbor right there in his flight suit, Captain Michu Fuchida, top pilot in the Japanese Air Force. Torah, Torah, Torah. He's the guy that said that. There he is with his King James Bible preaching the gospel. How about that? He got born again. Amen. Went around the world preaching the gospel. How are you going to make up stuff like that? By the way, while we're on cool pictures... You know, that Joe Biden is a bum, and I know he's a bum. Amen. I know he's a bum from personal experience. Not only was he in my dad's house 21 times in Delaware when he was a senator, because my stepmother was in Republican po uh, politics. She was on the state finance committee, and he's always got his hand out trying to get something from her. But, but here's a funny story. Again, I may have told this, but here's a nightclub in Delaware right here, picture of it, <clears throat> called the Stone Balloon. And it became the number one college bar in America overnight. It opened in 1972. And uh, Rolling Stone magazine voted it the best kept secret in rock and roll. Almond Brothers were there, Ray Charles, Bruce Springsteen. If you don't know who these people are, ask the pastor. 
the uh, Rolling Stones came that close to signing a contract. But I sold the cash registers to the owner of that club. When they opened up, I was in Delaware working for the Brandywine Cash Register Company. And the owners were Bill and Jill Stevenson. They were called Bill and Jill, like Jack and Jill went up the hill. Highly connected, politically connected people. But uh, the crazy thing is, uh, five years later, they were known as uh, Joe and Jill. Not Bill and Jill, Joe and Jill. As in Senator Joe Biden and Jill. The first lady was my customer in 1972. How, is, how can you make up something that nutty? But if you look up on your internet, Bill Stevenson, just Google his name. He's threatening to put a tell-all book out about how she was fooling around with him with Biden behind his back for several months before they ever broke up. And uh, so the idea is, the moral of the story is, if you steal a man's wife, you'll steal an election. Say amen right there quick, yeah. I'm going to get nervous. Yeah. Once a crook, always a crook. Yeah. But you shouldn't say bad things about political leaders. Doesn't Paul say something about that? Yeah, he does. Well, how come you're doing it? <laughs> One day the Lord put this on my mind. It might have been the devil, but this is too cool for the devil to have thought this up. You know what the little thought on my mind heard was? Tell them tell that your rewards if you want to give up a few of them. <laughs> Isn't that true? Yeah. And then he said, don't worry, Bill. I got to take them away from you in front of everybody, but I'm going to give them back to you <coughs> in the back room because I know he's a bum myself. <laughs> Excuse me, did you ever see Paul in Philippi, the guy that wrote all that stuff to you, when those little Napoleons were giving him a hard time? Oh, Yeah. They found out I'm a Roman citizen now, and they want me to sneak out of here in the dark. Tell them to come out here tomorrow morning with a brass band in broad daylight. I'll think about leaving. That's Paul. He had a bad day himself. All right, blah, blah, blah. What do they need? Another Italian joke, Lord? How, do you make, how, uh, how come Italians make good magicians? You ever heard that one? They make people disappear just like that. All right. All right, number one, deep six. Oh, by the way, if you want to see one more terrible illustration of deep state, deep statement activity before Bill Clinton, before Biden, you know, going back a ways, here's the Pearl Harbor story here. Look, that's page 907. Go one page in front of it here, page 905. There's a whole article, photocopy from the Federal Register. This is in 1942, page 9097. What is this article about? One of the biggest banks in America got caught money laundering for Adolf Hitler, keeping him in the war. Union Banking Corporation of New York, and here's the board members of that bank. Third name, Prescott Bush. 41's daddy. 43's grandpa. The Honorable Prescott Bush from Connecticut. Senator Bush. So this deep state's been going on for a long time. Also, back to COVID. The man that wrote the afterword to this book, I mentioned to you once before, I think, was the man that invented the neutron bomb, Sam Cohen. That's a picture of me and him out in his backyard in Brentwood, California. Some Oklahoma congressman hooked me up with him, and he thought I was the greatest thing that ever walked on two legs. I don't know. This is what he said. I consider Bill Grady to be one of the most unusual friends I've known in my 84 years. He's a Jewish physicist, worked on the atom bomb in 43, invented the neutron bomb in 58. And uh, he called my home once a week for seven years, up to the day he died. I had his ear. Ruckman told me he thought he was saved. He got saved because I witnessed to him all the time. But here's something he wrote uh, to help me get my book off the ground. He said, most Americans are totally oblivious to their precarious surroundings. Several years ago, my longtime friend and colleague, Joe Douglas, authored a book entitled America the Vulnerable, The Threat of Chemical and Biological Warfare whose preface contained the following statement, quote, now think about COVID in light of what you're going to hear. While the United States debates the development of a massive defense effort against nuclear attack, the fact remains that this nation is almost entirely defenseless against chemical, biological, and toxin weapons of mass destruction. Some of these weapons may already be secreted within our borders. Others could be synthesized by our enemies within a matter of hours or days at the most. Indeed, it is doubtful that most biological attacks would even be recognized for what they are. Even if it could be proven with certainty that the outbreak of a particular disease was not a natural occurrence and instead was deliberately instigated, it would be almost impossible to pinpoint the exact source. 
And that's if a government was trying to get to the bottom of it. Not Joe Biden avoiding his best friends over there in China. All right, so number one, deep six. Number two, deep state. Number three, well, who's responsible for all these progressive communist cockroaches t destroying our country right in front of our eyes? Yeah. You don't want to know. Chapter 4, verse 3. Uh, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. See that? What's that talking about? That they is talking about save theys. Lost people can't endure sound doctrine, then turn it off one day. Yeah. That's Christians. And it didn't say they won't believe sound doctrine. It said they won't endure it. Come on, brother. Hey, Tano, we're surrounded by Indians. What you mean, we, white man? <laughs> Remember that old Joe? That's Christians bailing out in the last days. Come on. No matter how hard he tries, he's not going to fill this building up unless he brings a smoke machine in and strobe lights, <laughs> a few of the things. Hey, that's what the Bible says. It's, it's tough news. But the Christians go belly up. So what's that got to do with anything? Paul told the church to wake up in Romans, Thessalonians, and I, and uh, I think Ephesians. We told them to wake up three times. That's why the revivals used to be called Great Awakenings, right? But according to that book, whenever the last days kick in, you can't wake those Christians up when they go out. They stay out. Yeah. Deep six, deep state, deep sleep. And you can't change it. And anybody that's got suicide in their family, my mother killed herself right in front of me, you know why people kill themselves. They lose hope. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. Where there is no vision. And you're the first generation. If we're in the last days, you're the first generation that can't turn it around. You go out there, beat your head in the ground, trying to get visitors to come, and they don't come. Well, you finally get them here. They look like they're happy. They won't come back. Yeah. That'll discourage you. You know it will if you got any brains. But you've got to get a handle on the fact that if you're in the last days, you're facing the first thing that no Christians in Philadelphia age have ever faced. You can't change anything. Should we throw the towel in then? Read verse 14. But continue thou, chapter 3, verse 14. But continue thou in the things which thou hast heard. You don't stop. You keep continuing. But you've got to have a different mindset that no other Christians have ever had to have. You've got to keep going. Anybody know how the Bible ends? Bible ends with a preacher on an island by himself. Don't amen too quick. A preacher by himself. Hey, what you mean we, white man? The time will come when they will not endure sound rock. All right, that's about 10 off, so I'm done. So let me close with this. Deep six, deep state, and deep sleep. You know, I showed that outline to my wife. What a mistake. You know, every preacher wants his wife to tell him how good he does. Yeah. When you finish your sermons on Sunday, you're always waiting for something from her. Don't look down. It's not time to pray. I did the same thing. I did the same thing. And let me tell you what he'll do. Same thing I used to do. If the wife doesn't volunteer some great uh, praise, you know what he'll say? Honey, was I too hard on the people today? I know you've said that. That's one of the greatest lines a preacher will use with his wife. Stand by your man. He's trying to get something out of his wife to, you know, encourage himself. She's laughing back there, so I know you're guilty. <laughs> I did it. If I did it, I know he did it. Watch this. So I'm looking for my wife. I said, honey, look at this outline. And this is wild, eh? You know what she said? She looked at that outline. She said, wait a minute. She said, I see a fourth point in there. I said, there's no way you could have a fourth point. It's three points in a poem. Anybody knows that? She said, I don't care what you say. I'm looking right at it here. She said, I get the Bible open in 2 Timothy 4. So I pull rank on her. I said, listen, try to get spiritual. I said, God's a trinity, and we're created in his image, so we're body, soul, and spirit. And the whole world's filled with threes. Ruckman used to point that out. Yes, no, maybe uh, father, son, uh, husband, wife, kid, red light, yellow light, green light, past, present, future. Uh, Mo, Larry, and Curly, say amen right there. Amen. Every time you tell a stupid joke, you've got to repeat something three times before you hit the punchline. Yeah. That's because of who God is. Well, how come Italians can't count to 10? You ever heard that one? Oh, shut up. <laughs> I'm glad that guy don't follow me around the country. Oh, thank you. Every time they get to two, they run into a tree, in case you didn't hear. I said, okay. She said, I don't care what you say. It is. It's right there. I said, what is it? She pointed at verse 6. For I am now ready to be offered in the time of my departure. Is it hand? That sounds like deep space. Yeah, there you go. 
your wife ever gets you bad? I mean, my wife, I married up so high I had a nosebleed on my honeymoon. So. <laughs> Boy, it's hard when you, you got a good spiritual wife and they can kill you like that. So my second, my second chapter in the book, first chapter is called The Last Latte. That's, the, that's what I'm giving you this morning. Next chapter, trumpets out of the case. It's time to get out of here. And hey, listen, I preach that point in, in a church in Missouri. I go to this crazy church five times a year, one church. An ex-Marine and a former Marine, so he's jarhead. He don't know, shouldn't have me in there five times a year. But as soon as my wife gave me that fourth point, I preached that at his church. He said, Brother Grady, I'll give you a fifth point uh, for the millennium, deep dish. I said, I has to have an ass, man. But he wrote me a $20,000 check. Print perilous time, so he can put anything in there he wants. All right, you get the idea? Deep six, plenty of death. Deep state, you know who's behind it. Who's responsible? Us. Deep sleep. But thank God we're getting out of here. Amen. These spaces around the corner. Preacher, would you come? Thank you, friends. Funny when you called Joe a bird. <laughs> a who? Joe, a bird. Oh yeah, she's crazy. Yeah. Hallelujah. Welcome back. Thank you. Good to see you. Good What's your name again? Alana. Oh, that's a pretty name. I remember. Good to see you. Yeah, you know the guy interfering with your Italian jokes. That's his. Husband.
message Jesus, his ministry, his life, every move that he made, every decision that he made was based upon scripture. The Old Testament scripture supported everything that he did. That's how he was able to preach and teach with such authority. It wasn't just him speaking, it wasn't just his opinion, his words, his life, his ministry, his actions, his works were supported by the Old Testament scripture. You know what, if, you're, if your life's supported by the scripture, that's the Entire book, humanism, not even one. That book was not written by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Because authors that are written, that write by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they write inspired by the Word of God. Brother Grady was inspired to write this book. You don't get too far into this book to find out what inspired him. You know, like, just in his dedication to his son that a year ago. Scripture, 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 scripture. Ten chapters. Bible, 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 Bible. Hey. That book, that Holy Moments book, went out. I need to be harsh. I'm just telling you the truth. It's not supported by the scripture. The author doesn't even quote the scripture. So if it's not supported by the scripture, they that worship the spirit must, must worship him in spirit and what? It's true. It's true. Scripture. Ten chapters. I will not have this is this is a mission. You, you bring up the word mission, you think of, you think of Africa or South America. No, Sioux City, Iowa. People need the gospel. What amount of works could you possibly do in order to receive a free gift? That's not how that's not how a free gift one pays for it. That is eternal life.
not more valuable than an eternal soul. Thank you, my Lord, for bringing us here today. I pray for those that are not feeling well. That they... Amen. There's nothing like being here in person. Thank you, fellowship. Being here, being able to enjoy each other's company and the good news of the gospel. Thank you so much, Lord, for putting me in my place. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for salvation and giving me that joy the world cannot understand. Amen. Thank you. All right, my friends, Mark 16. <clears throat> Mark 16. Where's my man Matthew at? I mean, uh, do me a favor, Matthew, would you? There's a garbage can in the bathroom. Could you get that for me? My father got a Christmas card one year from Bobby Kennedy. He was a doorman on Park Avenue, and Christmas, all the doormen get big bucks. Yep. Christmas time, you know. Paper boy, you're supposed to give him a tip on Christmas, you know, in an envelope. He said, Billy, I got, thank you. He said, I got the card from Bobby Kennedy. He said, when I opened it up, there was just a picture of his family in there. Yeah, had like 20 kids, remember? Yeah. He said, what do I care about his family? There was no scratch in there. He said, I threw the picture in the garbage. All right, you don't pay much, you don't get much. What do you want? Mark 16. <laughs> Let's stand for the reading of God's Word. I'm going to talk about that garbage can here in a minute. You'll see what's going on. Mark 16, verse 9. Now, when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. And she went and told them that had been with him as they mourned and wept. And they, when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed not. After that, he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it unto the residue, neither believed they them. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven, as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned, and these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven, and sat on the right hand of God, and they went forth, and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. Now, one more verse. Turn to 1 John 4. 1 John chapter 4. One verse. Very popular verse for sure. Verse 8. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. I'm going to tie in Mark 16, 9 through 20, with 1 John 4, 8. Matthew, where'd you go? Pray for us.
Thank you. you. May be seated. Uh, my first book came out because of Dr. Ruckman's influence in my life. It was on the King James Bible. Most all of you, even the Lord told me he's got this. He really did. How do you say stuff like that when I get struck down with lightning? Did you ever see Crocodile Dundee? Me and God are mates. I'm close enough to the Lord. I know what I can get away with. He likes half of my jokes. I'm telling you, he does. <laughs> Learn to laugh at yourself. Amen. <clears throat> If you can't laugh at yourself, somebody else will do it for you. So this book came out in 1993 in March. Dr. Ruckman told me, don't put my name, don't put my name in there. And he couldn't make me not obey that. But he recommended it so the book will get out. He put my name in, nobody will read it. So some of you know this. So I, I asked his permission to put his lion on the spine because I wanted to sneak him in some way. So I, his lion from Revelation Commentary became my logo for Grady Publications. So all these people that hate Dr. Ruckman's got his lion on there. You know, that's when they're yelling about Ruckman being divorced while they're carrying a Schofield Bible. And when Schofield was divorced and remarried. They don't know that. Anyway, so this came out 30 years ago in 1993. Um, and it's got, I don't know, it's 15 printings. The Lord's been blessing it. Now, I have a chapter in here. Chapter 5. Uh, called Mark 16, 9 through 20. So one whole chapter in this 400-page book defending these 12 verses in Mark 16. You can jump back there if you're not there, if you're still in 1 John. Okay. Um, the, the Peter Ruckman of the 19th century was an Englishman named John Burgon. John Dean John William Burgon, and he wrote uh, five major books defending the King James Bible. I mean, really heavy books to work your way through. One of them is called Mark 16, 9 through 20. So one of his five books was entirely devoted, 300-page book, to defending these 12 verses. This section of Mark 16, these 12 verses, that is the first... You gotta bear with me for a little ground foundation here. It's the first of the two <coughs> largest sections of the scriptures that have been attacked by Satan. <clears throat> you know, if you go through uh, the Bible, there's all kind of verses that have been yanked out. Easiest way to influence one of your friends that's got a funny Bible: tell them to turn to a certain verse yeah. that's not in their Bible, and they don't know it until they look at it. Then they keep the King James verse numbering, so it jumps from verse 12 to verse 14. What happened to verse 13? Well, it's gone. Well, that's one thing. So there's about 17 entire verses missing. Then I have a, uh, I got a section in here somewhere. might take me too long to find it. I have, a, I have a whole section in here. Yeah, here it is. You see that big gigantic paragraph there? All it is is numbers. Those are the verses where most of the verse has been taken out. Not the whole verse, but half or two-thirds. See, that? that's a scripture address. See how many there are? Okay. Uh, the, uh, here are all the, the entire verses that have been taken out. Plus, they take the word hell out 40 times out of 53 places. They take the word Calvary out. Yep. They take the word Lucifer out. They take the word Jehovah out. And on and on, take the word sodomy out, and on and on it goes. But there are two sections of the Bible that have been attacked that constitute 12 entire verses in a row. Follow me? All these examples, one here, one here, one here. Here it is, 12 in a row. Mark 16 is the first one. There's a second one elsewhere. I'm going to show that to you as well. Again, this is foundation I'm giving you. So, it's the first of the two largest sections of Scripture attacked by the devil. Now, these two sections of Scripture, let me tell you three common denominators. First of all, they are both found in the Gospels. Number two, both of them attempt to delete the identical number of verses. Twelve. About that? The, number of, the number of the Jews, the number of Israel. And most importantly, both sections share a common theme. Where do you see that? It's going to blow your mind. 
And by the way, when I was here last time I said this, a man's man, pastor, doesn't need me to make this little speech, but I'm used to making it, and I enjoy making it. Don't ever let the devil try to get you to compare your pastor's sermons with the messages that an evangelist will bring in here. You understand? He's coming up with four new messages every week that have never been tried out on anybody yet. You're like his lab rats. <laughs> evangelist coming in with cufflinks, handkerchief ministry, you know, Rolex. You know, we, got, we, got, we only have about 12 sermons, and we've tweaked them for 20, 30 years. You can't compare the two. If you ever get an evangelist in here that bombs out one sermon, don't trust him. There's no need to bomb out. You understand? <coughs> Anything else, preacher? No, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Now, out of these two 12-verse 12, 12 sections I'm talking about, right? Mark's the first one. I didn't tell you what the other one is yet. Stay with me and we're walking. Mark, the Gospel of Mark, is the shortest of the four Gospels. You all know that. Yet it contains one of the most profound truths in the King James Bible. And this profound truth just happens to be found within that disputed 12-verse section. Got a Schofield Bible there. I don't know what Bibles you use. Ruckman's Bible is probably the only Bible that doesn't question these 12 verses. But all, even a Schofield Bible, the editors, you know, they're not inspired, and, they, and the editors were not C.I. Schofield himself. Uh, they, uh, they question these 12 verses. By the way, you want to see something freaky? Do any of you have a Schofield Bible with you here? Okay, we got one heretic over here. <laughs> Just two of us have it. Hey, Whoa. C.I. Schofield, the Bible that's falling apart is often owned by a man who's not. Somebody say amen right there. C.I. Schofield was a Confederate courier in the Civil War, teenager. He ran all over the battlefield, survived 18 major Civil War battles, including the Battle of Antietam Creek in 1962. 1862, the bloodiest day in American history. You know that, 23,000 casualties. He's running all over the place as a 19-year-old. God kept him alive to put this Bible together. and it, it did a lot of good for a long, long time, dispensationally laid out and so forth. But here's something might blow your mind, okay? So here's the, uh, the, the list of the, of the editors on the Schofield board. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight names. Eight theologians. Help. Look at here. Reverend W.G. Moorhead, D.D., President Xenia, Theological uh, uh, Seminary in Zeny, Ohio, right? That name ring any bells to you? Let me give you a hint. Ready for a big hint? Ready? Ready? Don't fall out of your chair when I show you this. Eat or eat or eat. <laughs> Want to see it again? Eat or eat or eat. <laughs> what Ask him. He knows everything. What, what does that mean? Joe. Who is it? That guy needs to go on, uh, what the heck's the name of that TV show? <laughs> Past, not, what's the name of that show? What's that, what's, that, what's that quiz show? Jeopardy. Jeopardy. He needs to go on Jeopardy. Hey, but bewitched. Yeah, yeah. Remember, remember her grandmother? Yeah. Or her mother, I mean, Agnes Moorhead? That, that editor there, that was Agnes Moorhead's uncle. Uh, she was a Presbyterian. She was a saved lady. Debbie Reynolds was her, they were best friends. Debbie Reynolds said, the only problem with my friend Agnes Moorhead is she's too religious. Everywhere she goes, she takes her Bible with her. Again, we get to heaven, we're going to be shocked at the people that are there, the ones that are missing, and the folks that, in fact, that were there. You know, the three biggest shocks, right? Did you know when she kicked the bucket, would you believe she, um, she uh, left her entire estate to Bob Jones University? That? That's a conservative... Agnes Moorhead was. Is that crazy or what? We look at the Schofield note down here, verse 9. Uh, if, you're, if you're reading, okay, uh, you know, you get a new, you get a, con, a young convert, just let the, somebody to the Lord, you give them a Schofield Bible, and they'll read, tell them to start reading in the Gospel, in the New Testament. So they buzz through Matthew to get all excited, new Christian. Now they're in, coming to the end of Mark. And they get down to verse 8. 
And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulcher, for they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. Uh, now when Jesus was risen early, the, oh, wait a minute. There's a little number one in front of the word now there at verse 9. You know, for a footnote reference. So the, Joe Schmo that you led to the Lord, he doesn't know anything yet. He still thinks Job will help him find employment. Amen. He's like, he's like Trump, 1 Corinthians. He don't know what's going on here. And he goes down to the bottom of the page, and there, next to the one there, it says, chapter 16, verse 9, it says, The passage from verse 9 to the end, meaning the end of the chapter, is not found in the two most ancient manuscripts, the Sinus problem and the Vatican, and others have it with partial omissions and variations. But it is quoted by... Uh, uh, IRA account and Hippopotamus in the 2nd or 3rd century. <laughs> now, I don't know what Irenaeus and Hippolytus will mean to Joe Schmo, you just led to the Lord. That bothers him to read that. Now, what these people won't tell you is, and this is not a class on, uh, on Scripture now, on Bible uh, uh, versions, <clears throat> but there are, there are 5,000 parts of the New Testament that have survived history. A manuscript is a part of a, of, of a Bible and it's non, in its handwritten format, pre-printing press, right? Yeah. Sometimes uh, somebody will find 80% uh, of the Gospel of John in some ancient library. Well, that's a manuscript and that's logged. It's 5,000 logged manuscripts. Some are just pieces of a half of a page, right? Out of the 5,000, and it, all in Greek, handwritten Greek manuscripts, 5,000 Greek manuscripts, 620 of the 5,000 have Mark 16 to look at. Yep. If you want to examine how many have the 12 verses, how many don't, right? If you laid them all out on the pews here, one right after the other, you looked at them all, the final score would be 618 have these 12 verses. Only two don't. And they're the two worst manuscripts that have ever been found. Yeah. You, you can't know all this. Don't ever get discouraged. You try to learn a little bit. I never let my schooling interfere with my education. Now educate yourself. You read stuff. And uh, so only, 12, only two, verse, two manuscripts don't have those 12 verses. 618 do. Now remember, like the teenagers used to say, I am so going somewhere here. <laughs> and it has to do with... Easter, amen. So, based on all that, I got to wondering one day, what in the world was the devil so mad about in those 12 verses? Yeah, how about that? Why did he yank them out of our Bible? See, in all the modern Bibles, they either have those verses missing, or they're there and they have brackets around them yeah. with a footnote. The editors have moral uncertainty about these verses. There's always some question mark to make you question them. Uh, if they're not totally lifted out of the text altogether. So, <clears throat> why was the devil mad? What was it about those 12 verses? So, here's the key to where I'm going. Most people tell me when I preach this, they really enjoyed the sermon because they, they loved it because it made them think. Yeah. Here's where we're going. How you doing? Good, how are you? <laughs> We got to find something that's in those 12 verses. You got to follow me now. That's there exclusively. How about that? If it's someplace else, what's the deal about yanking, them out, yank, yanking those 12 verses if the devil is mad about this certain thing? If it's found someplace else, that wouldn't make any sense. We got to find something in those 12 verses that is found nowhere else. Yeah, how about that? That would at least fit the theory. Are you with me? Okay, so let's. So I got to look at here, neighbor. What's the first thing I read here? Verse nine. Now, when Jesus was risen early, the what? First day. All right. You got whack out Seventh Day Adventist. You got wacky or Seventh Day Baptists that worship on Saturday. And uh, you know, Constantine changed the worship from uh, you know Saturday to Sunday. You know, in the third, or fourth century. Well. Christians began worshiping on the first day of the week because that's when the Lord came out of the grave. Yep. This verse tells you he came out on the first, on the first day of the week, correct? You, think, you might think Satan was mad at that truth. 
However, what does it say in chapter 16, verse 1? And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene brought the, verse 2, and very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came to the sepulchre. Yep. You see what I mean? It's sitting in verse 9. Matthew 28, 1, same thing, right? So there's other verses that say he came out of the tomb first day of the week. So that can't be it. When you read down from verse 10 through verse 14, this is interesting. All of those verses uh, deal with the fact that uh, the, uh, the, 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 the apostles were ignorant about the resurrection that was coming, and, and they had no idea of looking forward to the cross business, which anybody gets in a Bible college. Two things you learn in any fundamentalist Bible college. Everybody in the Old Testament is look, saved looking forward to the cross, and they're saved looking back to the cross you know, in the church age. The second thing is, Ruckman is the Antichrist. <laughs> okay? You look at these, you know, we just read through this, so you don't have to go over it again probably. Uh, verse 14, and when they heard that he was alive, they believed not. See it? Verse 13, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus is what it's referencing. Verse 13, and they went and told it unto the residue, neither believed they them, right? Verse 14, he unbraided them because they believed not them that had seen him after he was risen. Yep. Right? Do we have to go back through all the other verses? You're familiar with this already. Especially in Luke 14, they understood none of these things. Yep. Uh, John 20 clearly tells you they, 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 they knew not the resurrection at that time. All that stuff. If, uh, if, we, if they had believed, um, what's it say over there in 1 Corinthians chapter, not, uh, chapter 2, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. I heard, a, you know, when I was an unsafe Catholic I, in New York, growing up I saw Ten Commandments, blew me away. I saw the greatest story ever told yeah. by um, Max von Sydow playing the Lord. And for the record, you know what I hate more than transgenders and sodomites running around naked? <clears throat> what I hate more than any of that put together are these TV shows now with Jesus. Yeah, how about that? Running around, wrestling on the beach at Sea of Galilee, goofing off. One of the guys, <clears throat> man, I hate seeing that stuff. I a weekly show about Jesus. Max von Sydow, for a Catholic, man, that's scared a Catholic. He looked holy. He's crazy hippie Jesus they got. I'm going to tell you, neighbor. <clears throat> now, um, I heard an old preacher preach a sermon one time. How about this for a title? The greatest secret that was ever kept became the greatest story that was ever told. The reason Je uh, 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 Satan wanted Jesus on the cross was if they kill him, he couldn't be the king of the Jews. The Lord sucker punched the devil. He, the devil didn't even understand his death was going to bring about redemption for the world. Isn't that something? All right. So then I go down to the third idea. What about the Great Commission in verse 15? And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Well, cer certainly the, Lord would, the devil would hate that. But good night. The Great Commission is in every gospel. And Acts chapter 1, verse 8. So that can't be what it was, right? Tearing it out to get that, what's the point? It's elsewhere. Yep. <clears throat> what are we looking for? Something that's in those 12 verses that's nowhere else in the box. All right, so uh, last thing you got there, the last verses, 17 through 20, deals with signs and wonders. Paul explains their temporary use in Romans and in Corinthians. So that's, that's not an exclusive uh, section of Scripture. Well, that's discussed. It's elsewhere. Gee, Wally, what's going on here? All right. So, guess what? I found it. Okay? And I'm going to give you a hint. It has something to do with what the world calls the weaker sex. Or, as Scripture calls it, First, First Peter 3, 7, Likewise ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. I said it has something to do with the weaker sex or the weaker vessel. More specifically, it has something to do with God's attitude toward the weaker vessel. All you ladies here, pastor asked me where I wanted to go to eat. 
I said, if your wife and children or anybody's coming along, I want your wife to pick the restaurant. I eat somewhere every week. When I'm by myself, I'll eat at Jersey Mike's anytime there's one within 100 miles. Say amen right there. Oh. If I can't get the Jersey Mike's, I go to uh, Jimmy John's. Amen. Why do you do that? Because preacher's wives don't get out as much as maybe they would enjoy going if they could. So I let them pick the place. I didn't know I was going to get an Indian cuisine restaurant. That is so scary. When I'm going, I told, I, I told Mrs. Stevens, if we don't go to that Indian restaurant, I'm going to be offended. I know how to scrape stuff into my hand and put it in a napkin. I've done that many times. Usually when a preacher's wife doesn't know how to cut a, cook a steak. Sometimes they, you ever get a bad turkey? Oh, it'll, ruin, it'll ruin your mind for, for the rest of your life if you get a bad turkey not cooked right. Why? Because the women are special to God. Amen. You men won't get your prayers through like you could if you don't honor your wife. And listen, we're all different. Hylesites, Ruckmanites, camp meeting people, they all got the, you know, Quirk, quirkiness, unless they blend up a little bit and get, get everything together. But, you know, Ruckmanite teaching is you can't have a normal home. You've got to have a messed up family. That's what it seems like. And half, the, half these guys treat their wives like they're cavemen or something. Banging their wives in the head with clubs. Come on, brother. I, I don't know. I'm everywhere. I know what I'm talking about. The house guys don't run their homes. The wives usually run the homes. They're, they're wimpy guys. There's all kinds of problems, brother. None of us are perfect, like me. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Hey, <clears throat> Dr. Howe, hey, the weaker vessel. Dr. Howe said, a wife can tell you, she, t tell you she loves you one minute, tell you she hates you the next minute, mean it both times. Say amen right there. Amen. The reason the Bible says, uh, give not thy strength unto women, is because women uh, got a thousand chemicals and hormones in their body. That's why. <laughs> They, they're, not, they're not here for any particular important reason. They just create life. Yeah, That's all that. they do. But their body has to be set up to do that. So they're like this. I one time had a preacher in Texas criticize me and somebody I knew who was kind of friends with him. But I told some older mentor, the guy that wrote the final authority forward for me, Dallas Dobson, in Pasco, Washington. He was a 400-pound motorcycle cop in Mississippi when he got saved. And he was a... He, he was ultimate man's man, motorcycles, airplanes, built them and flew them. He was wild. And I, I cried on his shoulder one time about it, what this guy said. He said, that disloyal, I ain't going to say what he said, but you put the words on a paper, venue and said, I'll sign my name to him. He said a couple bad words. He's tried to make me feel like he loves me. He, that's uh, that blackly black. I said, I say, well, Dr. Dobson, I said, listen, I got upset. I said, not upset, I got frustrated. I said, he was probably just having a bad day. I'll never forget what that preacher said to me. He said, Brother Bill, real men don't have bad days. <laughs> Hello, man. You're supposed to run like this. You'll still you'll sin, but this is the way women run. Yeah. Not because they're stupid. Their bodies are like that. I, when I was teaching at Jack House College for 10 years, I had some doofy student one time say, Brother Greedy, man, I wish I could have been back in the Old Testament so I could have had me a harem. I remember the guy. I said, are you married, dude? He said, yeah. I said, well, you got 18 wives now. <laughs> Doesn't your wife change about every day and three quarters? Where God made you, dude. More suicides in Florida than most places. They didn't know they, they, the, the seasons are made to sh shake things up. How about that? Well, I'll tell you one thing, neighbor. I'm going somewhere. And so, because the woman is the weaker sex, who do you think Satan attacked in the garden? Of course. First Timothy, Dr. Ruckman, bless his heart, he used to say the whole world went to hell because one woman opened her mouth. He <laughs> <laughs> said, that's why you use red fingernail polish and red lipstick so you never forget that mistake. How about that? I told that joke to my wife. I thought she'd think it was funny. She said the whole world went to hell because one husband wasn't there looking after his wife. Yeah. You, know what he was you know what Adam was probably doing? Video games. 
You know, I told my wife that other joke about why Italians don't like to wear mustaches because they don't want to look like their mothers. And, and she, said, uh, she, said, uh, she said, I'm not Italian, and I, I hate that joke. She said, every woman should hate that joke. By the way, the greatest truth about this is in 1 Timothy 3.14, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. One of the sweetest things God ever showed me in my little Bible study, and it's not, not unique, was that um, Adam, Eve took that fruit. She was conned. When Adam did it, he knew what he was doing. Yeah, that? Now look at here. Did you ever have to finally decide? Remember that old song? There is Eve sniffling there with her bags packed. She's on the way out. Here's Adam. Look. You know what I think I'd have done if I was Adam? I'm sorry, honey. I have a nice life. Can I get a redhead this time? <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> but that's not what Adam did, did he? Because he was a figure of him that was to come. That's what Romans 5 says. So what did he do? He did the same thing Jesus did. Five things they shared. They both left the perfect environment to save their brides. <clears throat> they both forfeited their lordship over creation for their brides. They both forfeited their sinlessness for their brides. They both forfeited fellowship with the Father for their brides. And they both tasted physical death for their brides. Ain't that something, neighbor? Don't be crying in your soup all the time wondering whether Jesus loves you or not. And so, because 1 John 4, 8 tells us God is love, look how our compassionate God compensates the weaker vessels for their weaker state. Hey ladies, you ever realize what God did for you? Has done for you? How about number one, he sent his son into the world through a female womb. Did you ever think about this? God entered the world through a sealed womb yeah. and he left through a sealed tomb. The womb couldn't keep him out and the tomb couldn't keep him in. Somebody say amen. That's what today is supposed to be all about. There were four women at the cross. John 19, 24, all the men were running for their lives. <clears throat> These women were the first witness to the resurrection. And thus, they were the first to proclaim the completed gospel message. The first people they preached to were men hiding under their beds. And then these duds wouldn't even believe what they heard. Yeah. Come on, ladies, give me an amen out here once in a while. How about the first convert in Europe was a woman? And I think men should be the primary, if not the only, <coughs> breadwinners. Sometimes families are strapped, the woman works. I'm not going to condemn you because the first person God shows you being saved is a businesswoman. But men, you ought to be pulling the bigger load and making sure at the very least if your poor wife has to do some work outside the home, you better make sure you answer the stinking phone when it's the bill collectors. And don't throw everything at her to have her figure it out. My wife does all the paperwork in our home at my direction because I'm gone a thousand miles a week. She never pay, makes one decision who to pay and who to rob and who to pay. That's our job. Where do you get that? Genesis 3, by the sweat of the brow. Try asking your wife for a good night kiss when she's like this at the end of the night after all the, dealing with the bill collectors all day. You won't get a good night kiss because she's going to read between the lines on that one. Romans chapter 16, the Apostle Paul singles out nine women by name. By the way, the preacher may have mentioned to you the new book has a John and Romans at the back. You can read all these 16 women Paul singles out. Isn't that something? But here's, here's one of my favorite ones. Boy, you couldn't make this one up if you had to. Ladies, are you all listening? God's trying to compensate. He's giving you a, a bonus. Look, when a mob 
has a, 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 a pigeon goes to jail to, in the place of a mob boss, takes the rap, they call it, right? Goes to jail for 10 years. While he's in there, they're taking care of his family. He comes out, he gets a big bonus. You know what's the most common expression you hear at an Italian funeral? Can't hear you. You're choking back there. <laughs> If he'd only kept his mouth shut. <laughs> uh, listen, if the mafia knows how to do that, don't you think God knows how to do that? You ladies, you've got to become the weaker vessel. Someone has got to be used to bring life into the world. And so you're at a disadvantage in many ways. Well, I'll tell you one way you're at a disadvantage. Women can't handle sarcasm. They believe everything they hear because they're more pure than a man. And Peter Jennings used to say from ABC News, if you hear a rumor your mother loves you, check it out. A woman believes everything. Any restaurant I go in, I always say to the waitress, when I'm getting ready to give the order, I say, ma'am, especially if there's a group here, I said, you know, ma'am, I said, this is, and I always say it with a serious face, got to do it. I said, ma'am, uh, well, listen, we've been known to tip as high as 10% in some places. <laughs> if it's a man, he laughs. But a lady, sometimes they'll laugh, but they'll get real, you know, defensive for a second. Well, we work real hard, but I'm just kidding, lady. <laughs> See, we got to cross an arms already. <laughs> Body language, man. Listen, go into any mini mart in America, walk up to the counter, get ready to pay for your gas or whatever it is. A lady behind the counter says, pull your money out where they can see it. And you say, do you take, a uh, you take Hawaiian money here? You wouldn't believe the looks you get and the answers you get. And I say, you, know, you ever heard of Hawaii? You know what that is? They can't handle sarcasm. So ladies, here we go. Here we go. How about, how's this for compensation? Ready? Ladies, do you realize that you, God has given you power over your husband? He has no power over you the way you have over him. One of hers. The wife is the glory of the man. 1 Corinthians 11. You know what that means? That means a man will show a picture of his wife or girlfriend, show it off to his friends a lot more than you ladies are going to show his picture off to your friends. Uh, that means you don't mess with a man's wife. Uh, I had a brother, half-brother, same mother, different father, who <clears throat> went to Sing Sing Prison in New York for uh, three years for shooting a man on the front steps of a police station in Brooklyn when the guy was running into the police station for protection. My brother shot him right in the hip uh, as he was running in and then chased him into the police station with the smoking gun literally in his hand. And I said, what did they do to you in there, Gregory? He said, they beat the blankety-blank-blank blank out of me with rubber hoses for 48 hours. And then he went to Sing Sing for six, uh, three years, and while he was in there, my sister-in-law got beat to death by another guy she was fooling around with. I said, why is that? I told you in Sunday school, the Bible could be true. I believe that. Proverbs chapter, see the ladies right now are saying, it is true, why would he say that? Proverbs 6, verse 34, for jealousy is the rage of a man. Therefore, he will not spare in the day of vengeance. You steal a man's bread and get caught, you can give the bread back. You steal his wife. So why is that? Because the wife is the glory of a man. Amen. Want to know how this works, ladies? Anybody interested? It's how it works. You're his glory. Proverbs 17.3 says, children's, uh, the children of... Um, Come on, Lord. What am I doing wrong? Except Proverbs 17, 6, 7. Children's, yeah. Chil oh, no. Yeah. The glory of children are their fathers. How many of you men, when you were a little dweeb, running around in the playground, did you ever tell one of your friends, my mother can wash dishes better than your mother? Yeah. <laughs> if you did, don't shake my hand. You probably want to clip a clip on my comment. You said, my dad can lick your dad. That's, right. <laughs> That's in our genes. The glory of children are their fathers. 
That's why you dads can't afford to ever hurt your kids. Yeah. When you promise them you're going to take them somewhere, you forget about it. Don't try to buy them off with an ice cream cone. <laughs> Apologize to them. Say, I forgot, and I'm sorry, son. Lest they be discouraged. Okay. Go read that in Ephesians. They don't think you can do any wrong because you're the first prototype of the real father that you're going to transition them to. So, ladies, the kid's glory is the dad. See, look, ladies, when you're uh, telling your kid, don't smoke, don't smoke, don't smoke, he's looking at dad sitting on the couch smoking because you're spending all your quality time with the dweeb kid now and ignoring him. And he, he, you should be telling dad, honey, I know you can beat those secrets because you can beat anything you set your mind to. Well, yeah, I guess I can. And he'll get rid of the cigarettes because you're his inspiration. But most wives dump their husband when the kids are born. And they give the, all their quality time to the little dweeb. And the little dweeb's watching dad because he's a chip off the old block ministry. He don't care what you're saying. He's watching dad. You see how quiet it's getting in here? Yeah, how about that? Because stuff's sinking in. Well, ladies are saying, wait a minute. If, my, if the children's glory is the dad, not me, and, and my husband's glory is me, when do I get my glory? Yours is delayed. Yours is delayed. Proverbs 31 says, the children rise up and call her blessed. When the little kids are small, a little, when they're small, they think dad's the hero. They don't know mom's propping them up behind the scene. Yeah. They can't see that until they get up, get their own families. And then they realize, holy mackerel, mom's the hero and all the time. And you know what, preacher? I've been preaching that verse forever. The children rise up and call her blessed. I never saw the rest of the verse. Her husband also. And he praiseth her. Ladies, when you're a younger married uh, couple, your husband doesn't appreciate you as much as he will down the road. Amen. He's too busy trying to get the bills paid. You want the greatest truth in the history of the world? Uh, uh, what you call a Home Alone movie. At the end of the movie, they're in a uh, poker band in a rented truck. And John Candy says, hey, see Joe over there? He doesn't even know how many kids he has. Bill, he's never even met his kids. That's how husbands grow up in the family. They're fighting the wolf, keeping them off the porch, paying the bills, sweating out, <laughs> pulling the weeds. And then one day he sees the woman, who are you? Oh, yeah. We've been married about 40, 50 years, haven't we? I don't remember growing older. You hear that on Fiddle Around the Roof, that Jewish wedding song? You will. Watch my lips. I worship the ground my wife walks on. Second half of your life, you're going to realize what a bum you were in the earlier part of your marriage. I never, I never hit my wife one time with that hand. <laughs> <laughs> no, I got a perfect wife. She never complained. 50 years we're in the ministry. Never complain one time about anything. I'd say things about her mother and she'd get real bent out of shape. I can't figure out why. Jack Howes had the greatest mother-in-law joke in history. He said this guy and his wife were at the funeral home and mother-in-law's in the casket and the wife's crying, you know, and the husband's just standing there real stoically, you know. And then all of a sudden the husband goes nuts. Starts screaming, crying, pulling his hair out of his head, smashing the casket. Boy, does his wife get impressed. He said, Harold, I didn't think you cared for mother that much. He said, I thought I saw her move. <laughs> That's Jack Howells. I wouldn't tell a joke like that. He had the bald headed joke. He had all kinds of bad jokes. He had a joke about Bill Clinton. He had a spelling bee one time. He said, Mr. President, can you spell the word ear? He said, certainly. Ear. E-A-R. Ear. Very good, Mr. President. He said, can you use the word ear in a sentence? He said, sure. Ear. That was Jack Howells. <laughs> I can't understand how a minister can say things like that. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Anybody home? My mother, my mother killed herself. And my father at the funeral home spent the night in the funeral home with the body. <laughs> they locked it up, Donovan's funeral home, 2nd Avenue and 89th Street, 90th Street. And my dad sat on a chair next to my mother's body all night with a bottle of scotch, Johnny Walker or J&B something. He loved my mother. I worship the ground my wife walks on. 
you ladies, my wife gave me a King James Bible for a wedding present. The day I got married, I was an unsaved Catholic. I got saved eight days later. You ladies got great power over your husband. I was just joking a minute ago about that, but I wasn't joking. But it, it is funny. The wife of a preacher can encourage him, tell him what a great sermon. Even if it stunk, tell him it was a great sermon. Stand by your man. Have you ever heard that great song? Got married to what, eight, eight different guys? <laughs> Let me show you the best illustration for all this. Does the Bible say that the wife's the weaker vessel? Yeah. Anybody know what a vessel's for? See that bottle of water? A vessel carries something. We're the vessel carrying the Holy Ghost in our bodies, yes. Yeah. Well, I have an illustration about this. Look. The wife's the weaker vessel. See that? See that styrofoam cup? Ladies, that's you. Here's your husband. I used to always use a metal trash can. You can't find a metal trash can. They don't exist anymore. But I like that because I could bang on that. This is hard. That'll work. But look, look, ladies. This is your husband's vessel. You know why your husband's got a thick head? Because he's butting heads with the world all day. Hey, gentlemen, <coughs> hello, this is your wife. Let me show you, when you try to get her to figure out what bills to pay. Will you please start making some noise? Too quiet in here. <laughs> making me nervous now. I know we got messed up marriages here. You have to. There can't be that many. Hello. My wife was a nurse. When she had her psychiatric training in nut houses, you know, she said the, the professors would tell the nursing students, don't ever turn your back on a female patient. Because when a woman goes nuts, she goes nuts. <laughs> Hello? A vessel carries something. She's the weaker vessel. But she carries the stronger cargo. What do you think is more valuable? That H2O that's in that cup? Or this? Anybody home? You men have got the stronger car vessel, but you got the weaker cargo. You don't believe that? Watch what happens when the husband kicks the bucket. The widow goes on ticket. What happens when the old lady kicks the bucket? He's gone in no time. She's put here to be the helpmate. Ladies, I'm trying to show you how God compensated the entire female race. He gave you so much power, it's not even funny. Napoleon said, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. I hope that's not a messy diaper right there. What in the <laughs> snot is that? I thought it was just <laughs> wadded up pieces of paper. All right, tell that to the committee. <laughs> Jack Howell said a camel is a horse put together by a Baptist committee <laughs> okay now I'm, I'm past third base home plates where we go home and party you, you got off tonight relax which brings us to God's greatest compensation of all now tagging third heading to home plate right now that's how my sermons all are you got to wait to the end to get the main thought. And it reveals what that special exclusive truth is that's in Mark 16, 9 through 20. Remember, we're looking for something in those 12 verses that is nowhere else in the Bible. It's the truth that Satan must hate above all others, as evidenced by his savage attack on Mark 16, 9 through 20. And you'll never believe where it's hiding. Are you back to Mark 16? We're going to reveal it now. Drum roll, please. Would you believe? It's in the very first verse. <laughs> now, when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, well, you already covered that. Yeah, but I skipped over the last part of the verse. He appeared, what's the next word? First. First to who? Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. Do you know that the Gospel of Mark is the only 
book in the Bible, and this verse is the only verse in the Bible that tells us who was the first person to see Jesus' resurrected body. You say, what about 1 Corinthians 15? Paul gives you the whole list over there. Yeah, why don't you turn over there. 1 Corinthians 15. I'm going to tell you, neighbor, this is a great sermon. Joe Boyd used to say, if I don't get amen, I'll amen myself. Amen. Okay, Pastor, if you wouldn't mind helping me here. My, my page is all torn up here. Amen. So uh, why don't you read uh, chapter 15. Start reading verse 1. And I'll, we'll make like it's a black church. I'll interrupt you every few minutes. I'm the black preacher. You're the uh, deacon. Go ahead, uh, Deacon Stevens. Go ahead. Moreover, brethren, I declare uh -huh. unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. Yeah, you stand. Go ahead. By which also ye are saved, uh -huh. if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, uh -huh. unless ye have believed in vain. In vain. For I delivered unto you first of first all. Of all. That which I also received, mm -hmm. how that Christ died for our sins according yeah. to the scriptures, uh -huh. and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. According to the scriptures. And that he was seen of Cephas. Oh, oh. and he was seen of Cephas. Yeah. Go ahead. Then of the twelve. And then of the twelve, uh-huh. And that he was seen of above 500 Ooh, brethren at 500 once, at one time of whom the greater part remain unto this present but some are fallen asleep uh-huh after that he was seen of James after then, that then of all the apostles then uh-huh and last of all he Ooh, was seen of me also last of all as of one born out of uh-huh yeah it said he was seen of Cephas is that right yeah. does it say seen of Cephas first no nope. He's trying to establish his apostolic authority, so he's laying out all the brethren. Yeah. But I got in too, he said. Mary wasn't important for that. you got to go to Mark to find out who he appeared to before he appeared to the first pope. How about that? I'm going somewhere with this yet. We're going to have a blowout there at the end of the, right before home plate, where Yogi Bear is waiting to tag me out. Now let's go to John 20, where the real story is. John 20. This is a great day to preach on this, Resurrection Sunday. Okay, <clears throat> verse 1. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, there's our heroine, when it was yet dark under the sepulcher, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher, and she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, of course that's John, and saith unto them, they have taken away the Lord <coughs> out of the sepulchre. Nobody's looking for him to have been risen. His body's been stolen. And we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple and came to the sepulchre. And so they run down there and, and they stick the head in. And per, It's funny, John beats Peter, but Peter... Peter's more bold than John is. John hits the brakes and he won't go in. Peter lumbers in second place. But he dives head first because he's cool. Verse 8, Then went in also that other disciple which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture, there you go, that he must rise again from the dead. Now look at verse 10. Then the disciples went away again unto their own house. Watch what happens now. Some of you have seen this. I believe that God let me weave it together in a very unique way, and that's at least what most people seem to say after we finish this little approach, okay? Stay with me. Verse 11. But Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher and see if two angels in white, sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. <clears throat> and they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me, 
Boy, I could cry when I read this. There's so much pathos in the statement. Sir, if thou hast borne him hence, look, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Isn't that pretty? Jesus saith unto her, Mary, she turned herself. She's kind of talking to him like this. Isn't that funny? She's still looking at that empty tomb. Look, he's standing behind her. Yeah. And Mary, she turned, look. And saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master, please put your seatbelt on. If you got a heart monitor, check the batteries. Watch it. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not. Well, you might have COVID. <laughs> See it? Don't touch me. You don't have a mask on. <laughs> Why did he say, don't touch me? Because what? I have not yet ascended to my father. Is that what it says? I'm so going somewhere. Everybody knows we all have our own preaching style. I love sneaking up on you at the end. Matthew 28. Mary and the women, other women show up there. And then the other women take off and leave Mary alone there. They take off when they see the empty tomb. The angel says, Hit, go up there and tell his disciples, right? Verse 8. Verse eight, 7. Go, tell, go quickly tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. So, um, this is so good. Um, watch this. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy and did run to bring his disciples' word. Now, these are the other women, the other Mary. Yep. And uh, Mary Magdalene is not with them. You, you've seen this before. I want to put it together if I can. And verse 9, And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them saying, All hail. And they came, and he said, Touch me not, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. Is that what it says? And they came and, what? Held him. You know what it says in the Greek? He let them hold him. They held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then said Jesus to them, Get back, will you? Be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee. Anybody see a difference? Sure. Now watch. I am so going somewhere here. <clears throat> I went to Jerusalem when I was saved 10 months. My, my wife, just newlyweds, didn't cost me anything to go over there. I had a free ticket on Air France and Air First Class, actually, because I was in the airlines at the time. And I just wanted to run over to the Holy Land right after I was saved. I didn't get any bus or any tour. Just rented a car over there, ran all over the place. We were, on, we were in a Jerusalem on Friday at about 5.30 in the evening. And we went to a little, little like an orange juice stand. In, sat on a stool inside, was in, uh, drinking orange juice. And all of a sudden, the guy goes nuts. Typical Jew, rough, no, care, no class. He starts chasing everybody out of his place at about a quarter of dead of. And he's yelling, Sabbath! Sabbath! Sabbath. Friday night, 5.30. Yeah. 6 p.m. Their days change. You know that. Ours changes at 12. And he threw everybody out of it. I can't finish it. Get lost. Put, throws us outside. Pulls the big chain across the front of the place. I still remember. Hey, man, what are you <laughs> You know, Jesus didn't get up this first day of the week, Sunday morning, Easter sunrise service when Jesus gets up. He's on that slab, and one second after 6 p.m. probably, his eyes open, and he gets up. That's 6 p.m. Saturday night. That's the end of the three days and three nights. That's it. When did Mary show up with the women? Eh, 12 hours later, 6 a.m. roughly. He's been up for 12 hours. Is that right? Yep. What's he doing? 
hanging around, waiting for somebody special. He didn't cast seven demons out of those other women. He was the one who cast the demons out of them. Now, my wife gave me a hard time about preaching this because she says she thinks it's borderline, not blasphemy. You know, my wife's picky with me in a good way. She's my proofreader. I usually listen to her. But, she, you, know, she, you know, she grew up totally different <laughs> than I grew up. So I tell her, I'm, I just say this for emphasis to make people get the idea, that's all. You know what one of the things the Lord was doing through the night, those, through those 12, I don't know where he was going. He's hanging out somewhere. But she was the first one that he appeared to. Yeah. You know what my wife gets mad about? Me saying this, ready? I said he was probably doing stuff like this through the night. Ready? Hang on, Father. I'll be there. Hold your horses. The title of this sermon, I used to preach it as, He appeared unto Mary first, right? That's the verse. But I add one word to that verse as far as the title of this message. He appeared unto Mary first, comma, literally. Hang on. What do you mean? Don't touch me. I haven't ascended to my father yet. Go on. Tell everybody I'm okay. Yeah. Boom. You know. Come back. Okay. Grab me if you want. They were probably from the south. That's why they were hugging. <laughs> Hug it out. I didn't get that. He appeared to Mary before he appeared to his own father. The only one. The only one. And why is that? Because he wanted us to know how he feels about fallen women. They're the weaker vessel. They're easier to fool. Everywhere I go, I see shopping carts, homeless, street people everywhere. I always feel sad when I see the women. Yeah. They can't recover themselves from that problem as easy as, easy as a man might. Giving honor unto the wife is under the weaker vessel. Satan hates this holy relationship that Mary had with Jesus. I don't know how to love him. Anybody remember that from Jesus Christ Superstar? Yep. Mary and Jesus having a relationship. The apocryphal gospel of Philip, when Jesus kisses Mary on the lips, the apostles protest. <clears throat> the 2014 best-selling book, The Lost Gospel, when Jesus marries Mary and has two children. You ever heard of the Da Vinci Code? Same garbage. All right. I'm just about done. You say, Grady, Dr. Grady, that's really amazing. But you said that there was a matching 12 verses. There it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let he that is without sin yeah. cast the first stone. Oh. Only place in the Bible you see Jesus defending an adulterous woman. Satan grabbed both of those sections. Look. Twelve verses each. Like the twelve hours Jesus hung out waiting to see Mary. Ain't that something? Anybody ever see the um, Footprints poem? Who hasn't seen it, right? Get on the internet and research how much debate there is about who wrote it. Lawsuits, everything. The guy that wrote it was a Baptist preacher. Willard Thomas. He's in heaven tonight. You can see it, the 80% of the poem in his oldest poetry book. He had 150 poems committed to memory that he wrote. I, he asked me to write the forward to his last book, Gathered Fragments, it's called. <clears throat> he passed it in Gainesville, Georgia. Spookiest church you ever go into. Come in the back door, look down the aisle, above the baptistry, gigantic words, welcome Holy Ghost. One of them southern churches, man. I preached for him one time before he died. I preached for him many times. 
And I sat in the back, got in late, and I, I was preaching the next night. And the, the, the preacher the, the first night was, was preaching a sermon. I'm sitting on the back row, and right in front of me there's a woman and two teenagers. And the woman was dressed kind of worldly enough. She seemed like a visitor. At the invitation, the, uh, one of the teenagers went forward, and the other teenager went with the other one. She just sat there. But I noticed during the sermon, the lady was doing this the whole time. I mean, way in the back row, you know, now looking at her phone, trying to follow everything. Like, she really was glued in. We went into the gymnasium after the service, and, uh, you know, the, stand, the, the seats, the benches are pulled down. She's on the bottom rung eating a hot dog with the two girls, and I'm walking by. The Lord impressed me to speak to her. I said, ma'am, I was sitting behind you during the service. My name is Bill Grady, and I'm one of Pastor Thomas's friends, and I'll speak in tomorrow night. But I, you seem so interested in the service, I thought I'd ask you if there's anything you wanted to know <clears throat> about. Boy, that lady broke down crying like nobody's business, like an explosion. <clears throat> you know, it might be cool if you're hooked up to the Lord and he can speak to you. And don't make a mistake of saying, I wish I was a preacher to have cool stuff like that happen to me. If you believe that, go to the Lutheran church. This is a Baptist church. There's no clergy and laity here. We're all connected. Yep. You better have your stories. You better know when the Lord speaks to you. And about that time, Amy is her name. You said amen. I'm always trying to remember what the preacher's daughter's name was when I tell this. I can never remember it. Amy, thank you so much. Elvis has left the building. Amy walks by, pastor's daughter, tall lady, long black hair. I said, Miss Amy, I, th I, said, I think this lady might want to be interested in being saved. <laughs> Good lady's doing that. And the lady took her into the side room and led her to the Lord. I talked to that and, and they announced it tonight at the, at the service. The whole church went crazy. I think they announced it, I mean, in the gym, maybe the next night. <clears throat> a couple of months later, I called that preacher on the phone, and Brother Willard Thomas was his name, and, and he said, you know, I said, I remember that night when that whole crowd went nuts. What was that all about? He said, didn't you know? I said, what? And that lady owned the largest adult bookstore in the county, almost in the whole state of Georgia, by a big truck stop. Terrible, wicked reputation. She was the owner of it. She closed the thing down, of course, or got out of the business, became a faithful member in this church, she told me. She said, Brother Grady, the first thing that woman asked my wife, said, Miss, Mrs. Thomas, could you help me buy some clothes to make me look like a Christian? Christian lady. And then he said, but you want to be sure to be praying for her. She's got serious advanced MS. She won't be with us much longer. And she passed away a couple of months later. She's up there with Mary Magdalene tonight, my son, and your loved ones. God cares about fallen women. They're the weaker vessel. He cares about any woman. Ain't that something? By the way, you know what you were before you got saved? We're the body of Christ. We're the bride of Christ. You know what we were before we were saved? We were soiled doves. All of us spiritually. You'll read that in Song of Solomon 1 verse 5. I am black, she said. Black, but comely. But my beloved is white. Song of Solomon chapter 5. No Middle Eastern person is white. They're olive skinned but they are white when it comes to tight. You know what your Savior was? He was white. You know what you were? You were black as the ace of spades. He became black so you could become white. He became sin for us who knew no sin. You know why that is? You know why we're, he come out of that tomb today? Resurrection Sunday. You know why? Because black lives matter. I'm done. I'm done, look. Oh, how he loves you and me. You sing that song? Yes. Oh, how he loves you and me. He gave his life. What more could he give? Oh, how he loves you. Oh, how he loves you. Oh, how he loves you and me. Preacher, would you come? What, a, what an easy crowd to preach to. I hope this elevates the ladies this morning because they deserve it.